Answer questions about the internship class and the job fair. I'm glad they reminded me. Next Thursday, we have a job fair. We have some employers coming, and they will give brief presentations describing what jobs they have, and then you can try to get those jobs. Bring resumes, meet people, and you can just show up at this thing and get those jobs without having anything to do with official things to at the college, and that's fine, because I really don't care. I just want the employers to find the right people so they'll come back and take more. But if you want to get credit for doing this, you take 197 or 198, it's an internship class, and there are no lessons or book or anything. What happens is you just get your employer to sign on a form saying you did good work, and if you did, then you get credit. That, that's our job experience program. Um, so you can take 197 and 198, which is required for some of the certificates and stuff, and in order, but in order to succeed in that class, you have to get a job. We have a few on-campus jobs, and there are unpaid internships that are fairly easy to get, and there are paid ones, which are more desirable, and people compete for those. So it's good to come and hear what people want. Um, I recommend checking this out because you should hear what employers are really asking for in the field and determine how relevant your classes and your training and your plans are. Find out what people really want. Um, and you know, I hope, I hope nobody's under the illusion that something like an A plus or a net plus will get you a job because it won't. That's the first step. You have to have something more than that typically. Um, and anyway, so check this out if you like. And if you want to get college credit in addition, then you take 197 or 198. Anyway, yeah. For the jobs on campus um, here, uh, do you have to be um, a FAFSA student in order for you to get the jobs? No, uh, but you would have to have some kind of that if you want to get paid. You, otherwise, you'd be working for free, a volunteer. So if you want to get paid, you have to do If you want to get paid, uh, typically you have to get federal work study, which I think, I don't quite know how that connects to FAFSA. Yeah. The problem with that is that if you have a bachelor's degree already, you don't qualify for this. Stuff. Yeah, a lot of people are not eligible for FWS, I know. Um, but we don't have much funds to pay on-campus workers, so um, the ma most of them are working on FWS. There's a couple that get hired from a small pool that are not FWS eligible, but those are hard to get. So the off-campus jobs are more likely to make you money than the on-campus ones. Good? Well, let me just uh, say a few words about the first chapter. It's, there's not much to it. And then I'll uh, start your lock picking. So, um, 123. Sam, one question about yeah. the Do you have any idea what some of these positions may be? Um, not in any real detail yet. A couple of them have talked to me, but they, right now it's all kind of up in the air. Um, I'm hoping Sonic comes. And if Sonic comes, they want a bunch of people because they're an internet service provider. They want people to lay cable and people in sales and all sorts of things, but it's not 100% sure they're coming. Uh, some of the others are looking for help desk. Uh, they have a variety of requirements. But typically, um, it's different every semester though. All right, so here's the first chapter, which like I say, won't be on the final exam, it's just orientation. Um, everybody, let me get this thing to start. All right, so an ethical hacker is somebody who uh, tests security and breaks through things, but they're ethical because they get the permission of the target first. This is, there used to be cracker and stuff, different terms for this. This is the current popular term for people who learn how to hack and then don't break the law. They hopefully have as much skill as the criminals, but they have enough sense not to do the illegal stuff. So. Um, these guys are hired by companies to perform penetration tests, typically for compliance. If you have um, credit cards and you process more than, I think, 300,000 transactions per year, you are required to have a penetration test every year. And if you, many other industries are required to have penetration tests on some basis, where you hire somebody who is credentialed and they come in and they check your security and this is part of your ongoing security improvements. It is kind of insane because any competent penetration tester has a success rate of 100%. They always get in and they always become domain administrator. So you could argue that this is insane and senseless, but that is the way of the real world. There is always a way in, and even after you patch all the holes, next year they'll find another way in. That's just the way it is, and you have to get over this myth of perfect security. Uh, this is probably the first thing people learn in security, to be a security professional, um, there is a certain little uh, bit of toughness of mind required, like being a doctor. Well, there's a, a well-known intern syndrome. If you, you go to med school, you learn all these scary diseases. And now, when you're backwards, you say, oh my God, that could be my kidney. I could have cancer. And you freak out. And the same thing happens to security professionals. Once you understand how many attacks are going on out there, you might freak out. 
But you, now you understand the truth is, the truth is everybody is under attack, nobody is safe, and what you have is you define security. Security is when you have held the crime down to a low enough level that people can get their job done. You can never get the crime down to zero. You can never have a system that is totally protected so nobody can get in. You have to do threat modeling and say, what are we worried about? Like right now, because of Snowden, a bunch of people heard about how the NSA is hacking everything, which is absolutely their job. Their job is to find all the secrets in the world from our military enemies. So they have the most dangerous people in the world and they laugh at everything. Your password, your firewall, your hardening, ha ha. They can get through all that because that's their job. So now people are trying to get, so I need encrypted email so the NSA can't get in. Well, forget it. There is nothing you can buy that will stop the NSA and there never will be. So if you're doing something and you think the NSA is after you, you've got a big problem. <laughs> and there is nothing you can put on your computer that's gonna save you. So realistic threat modeling is more like it. More likely, like a college is not trying to hide from the NSA, but we would like people not to be stealing the social security numbers of the students. We'd like them not to be stealing credit card numbers from the cafeteria and stuff like that. And that you can do, stop run of the mill criminals. So you have to decide what are you really, what level of security do you want? And now what kind of defenses do you need to achieve that level of security? But there's no such thing as perfect security. So your penetration testers find one way in, then there's security auditors that do a thorough audit of your network and tell you all the, um, all the vulnerabilities they can find. All right, so the, um, the sneering term for beginning pen testers is, is script kiddies, the people that aren't good enough to get a real job because they just run tools and they don't even understand how they work. In this class, I'm hoping to get you partway above that level where you can use the tools in Kali Linux and you understand what they're doing. And then beyond that, you move up to where you really learn how to script your own tools in 124, and that's the next step forward. Um, so uh, that's the idea. You'll be getting, we'll get the, the basics of how to do the most important penetration testing activities in this class. And um, I think that's a, really about all worth mentioning here. Let's see if I got any. I mentioned all these certification programs. Uh, Security Plus and Net Plus will get you started. And Certified Ethical Hacker is another step forward, and OSCP or CISSP are the ones to get after that. So um, the laws I've already talked about, the main one that matters to us is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Law 1030. It makes it illegal to access anybody else's computer and do something you're not authorized to do. So that makes it very easy to break the law and doesn't actually make people too safe. So now, what I want to do is just say a word about the structure of the class and then pick clocks. So everything's on this website, samsclass.info, and here, uh, your homework, your, your quizzes, I already talked about, the quizzes are in this online system, they're multiple choice, you have to do them anytime you want. Um, and then there's homework due after, um, right down here, we're gonna, on February 4, we're gonna start having home, homework due, um, project one and two due. And the projects are all down here. So the first thing you have to do is get some virtual machines working, and that's the first project. There are two virtual machines you need. Ah, uh, yes, you can download them from here. Um, in order to download the virtual machines, you have to have a name and password. I'm gonna write it on the board. I'm not gonna put it in the video because I'm not supposed to let non-students have it. Uh, it's here. You'll have to write this down, and I'll leave this up here so you can come get it later or take a picture of it. That's the name and password to get the virtual machines. The reason I can't just give them to the whole world is because it's a Windows machine and we are a Windows Academy so we can give Windows operating systems to our students but I can't give them to the whole world. So I'm going to log in here and show you what we have. And all right. So uh, you can get VMware Player, which runs for free on Windows here. You can get VMware Fusion here, which is not free, but you get a 30-day free trial if you're using a Mac. You can also use VirtualBox, which is free on both the PC and the Mac. They'll all work. And for CNET 123, you need Kali Linux and Windows Server 2008. And then in one project later, you'll use another ISO called the UBCD, but these are the main ones you use. So once you get these machines, you run them in your virtual machine player, and the first project, you just have to show that you got them working. Um, how many people have used virtual machines? That's what I find. Most people have, um, so it's not worth 
laboring this, there's, you just have to unzip them and run them. So in you here you have a Windows Server 2008 machine running in a simulated environment, a virtual machine. And then you get Kali Linux running, which looks like this. And now you have Linux and Windows, and now you can practice Linux attacking Windows. And actually, Windows attacking Linux sometimes, too. Yeah? Uh, both on the same machine is usually best. If you're working at home, just put them both on some machine you use. Everybody's typical laptop and home machine can do this. If you have maybe four gigs of RAM or more and any OS, you should be able to do this on your own machine. If somehow you don't want to do it at home for whatever reason, like your internet is too slow or the only machine you have is shared with somebody or it's your work machine or something, then work in the lab. Science 214, uh, that's going to be open almost all the time. I'll be there after class. And we have machines you can use there. It's a somewhat chaotic place, so you might find that other people are messing with your machines and stuff, so be aware of that. But it does have machines that can do all the projects if you prefer uh, not to do them on your own network, on your own machine. But I highly encourage you to set up your own machine to do this. That will teach you more because you'll have problems that I have not known about and have not put in the instructions. And more than half of the actual value of hands-on projects is the troubleshooting. You will always have networking problems and other problems, and as you learn to overcome those problems, you are learning the most important skill on the job because nothing ever works the way it says in the manual. You install it, and there's always some problem, and you have to get pretty good at Googling the error message and figuring out how to get around this problem. So um, once you've got your machines going, I'll probably demonstrate this one next time, but I'm not going to do it today because I'd rather get you started lockpicking. But here you learn do the first attack. There's a Kali has a tool you can put on it called Armitage. And Armitage is a graphical front end to make hacking like playing a video game. And the guy that wrote it intends to teach hacking to high school students with this tool. Now, I am not entirely happy teaching this class to high school students. Uh, I've tried it, and it seemed to me like they were too immature, and they really would hack somebody's Facebook, and we would all go down in flames. But the guy that wrote this tool thinks that's awesome, and he's perfectly happy to do it. So this is the first step. You, this is what Armitage looks like. And you can... Uh, run a scan by just clicking uh, uh, host scan, I think. Then it scans through your network, and it finds all the machines. It shows it found a Windows machine, and then it shows all the attacks you can have over here. So you just find an attack and drag and drop it on the machine. <laughs> then it runs the attack on the machine and takes over. When you take it over, it gets lightning bolts around it. And now that you've taken it over, you can restart it, install software, steal the key presses, turn on the webcam and the microphone. You can do anything to that machine. And you don't even need to know what you're doing. This is what I mean by script kiddies. There are people that use this stuff and they don't even know what it's doing. And um, if you have an incredibly helpless vulnerable system like an Android phone, this might be all you need. Although I don't know if there are Android attacks in here. There should be though. Because the way you get hacked by something like this is you don't update your stuff. And now Windows will vigorously try to make you update your stuff because Microsoft knows this. If you haven't updated your Windows system in a couple of years, there are attacks this simple that will just take over. Anyway, so I'm going to stop the recording and start you all lockpicking. Um, and let me just mention the lockpicking project. Um, it is not a required project because when I first started, I wasn't entirely sure it's legal. Now I know it's legal, so I can be much more upfront about it. But the, um, not everybody might want to do it. <coughs> But it's somewhere in here. Let me find it. There we are, X18. OK, so here's how this project works. Um, I have a bunch of lock picks and a bunch of locks. And what I've done is I, I started doing this because I went to a hacking convention like DEF CON and the others, and they had always have the lock pickers there. It's a huge event. Everybody loves it. And they, showed, they taught me how to teach lock picking. So let's talk a bit about a lock. Here's how a lock works. Um, Let's see if I can get a good picture here. Yeah, yeah. There we go. That's the picture I wanted. Okay. So here's how a lock works. The lock has a certain number of tubular holes in it. In our technical terms, which I've forgotten, experts will laugh at me. You've got a spring here and two pins. And normally, when you, okay, so that's the plan. These, these are cut to different lengths. When you put in the right key with the right elevation at each point, it'll raise these pins so they all line up on the shear line, and now the lock will turn. If any one of these is not the right height, that pin will be either too low or too high, and the lock will not turn. And that's a perfectly fine system. Now, the reason why it is so easy to pick locks is because they are cheap. I bought the locks we're going to pick today for $11 at Home Depot, and that means it cost them 50 cents to make that lock. 
And that means they had to use the cheapest metal and high tolerances on the machining and just mold the parts instead of making them perfect. So in fact, all these things are a little bit bent and twisted and sloppy. So you really don't have to exactly have it to the right spot. So if you just reach in and sort of move them around, you can pretty quickly find the right spot. And the secret to lock picking, if you're a professional, if you get good at it, is you lift the pins one by one, and since they're not all exactly the same, you put a little pressure on the key to turn it. And now one of them is the one that's going to catch. So you lift that one to the right point, it catches and turns a little, so now that one stays. Then you lift the next one until it catches, and if you're good and you can feel what you're doing, you can, ah, I got it, I got it, I got it. If you're totally sloppy, you just take a rake, which is just sort of a random thing, you just <laughs> scrape it around, hoping to randomly hit the right combination. And that works too, even with no skill, and that's what lockpick guns do. So anyway, the way to learn this, which is awesome, is you make weak locks. So you take locks and you give them a root canal. You just take them apart and throw away some of the pins. So I got locks with only one pin, and locks with two pins and three and four and five. Anybody can pick a lock with one pin. You just reach in with anything and lift it, and when you hit the right height, it'll open. Two pins is not much harder. So that's how they teach it at hacking conventions, and that's awesome. Make it easy enough, then you gradually go up. And you get five points for each level you go up. So there, I color-coded them. White is the one with one pin, green, yellow, red, and black is the complete unaltered lock on, off of your front door. And most people can get there within half an hour, and then you might think twice about locking your door and going off and believing that nobody's going in there. Yeah? How does a bump key work? A bump key just has all of these um, things ground down to the lowest possible level, so they're all at the bottom, and then you tap it, and it the vibration causes them to bounce up. And you just wait for them to bounce to the right spot. You do, you tap, 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 tap with, you have steady pressure. And one of the, the important things about lock picking is you need to have just a little tension, not too much or it'll just jam up. A little bit of tension and then you just tap, 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 tap and random, random motions occur and when it hits the right spot, it will open. And the rake is just the same thing essentially. You just move them around randomly until you hit the right spot. Yeah? Um, is there a certain number of pins on like most devices on there? Yes, a certain number of pins on locks? Yes, standard lock is five pins. That's what we're using. You can get more secure locks, and I have a link at the bottom of this project to uh, uh, some recommended locks. And we're gonna have a talk coming up this semester. I've got Deviant Olam coming, who is an expert on this stuff. There he is. He's gonna give a talk about lock picking, and it's gonna be um, Tuesday night. So check that out, I'll let myself in, tactics and pen testers. Um, so it's a big issue. All right, well, let me just stop this recording and then I will start you guys picking. You do not have to do it, it's worth extra credit, but you might as well start with some extra credit and most people find